So we have a very eclectic panel today, and we've heard a lot of things from morning. So we've heard about disruptive technology, artificial intelligence, we've heard about autonomous driving, we've heard, heard about all these new things that are happening, disrupting the industries that each and every one of us operate in. Now, what we really want to do now in this uh, particular session is get a practitioner's point of view on how we really manage our own engineering organizations and navigate through this change. That's what we're really here about. And to do that, we have a great set of panelists. Uh, we have them from different areas. Uh, so we have Joachim Nell, Joe, um, and he manages more than 100 global R&D centers in Continental. And so we've got him. He will add his perspective in terms of how this whole dynamics are changing, how do you look at different locations across this whole lens of core and context that Dominic so very clearly articulated today morning. And we have uh, uh, Peter. Peter, uh, Peter is in a very interesting role. He's at the focus of managing the different service provider relationships for this giant Intel corporation. And we all know Intel has gone through some massive changes, especially in terms of engineering. And his role is really looking at how do you work best with external ecosystem to manage uh, this change. And of course, uh, we have Pascal. Uh, Pascal is the chief strategy officer at uh, Altran. And he's been working across decades with multiple engineering organizations. And he will add his viewpoint in terms of how things have changed, what are the best ways to engage uh, with uh, portions of the ecosystem. So this is what we have in store for us. And what we'll do is uh, we will have a couple of slides from each of the panelists to set the context and the tone. And then we'll have questions from myself and, of course, uh, questions from you to really get that um, articulate practitioner's viewpoint in terms of managing and navigating this change. So uh, Joe, you might want to go first uh, with your presentation. You just put it up. Yeah, thank you, Sidan. Just a few words about uh, what is Continental doing here. Um, yeah. Yeah, so how disruption hits us in the past. We had our sensors, we had our systems, we had our black boxes, and it was very well established. And today, uh, what we see is that these um, components are used by others to provide services and um, add uh, value to it. And in the future, it will be more the function who, uh, where the uh, customer will pay for than the component. So who knows uh, that the rudder sensor in his car is from Continental? See, uh, we, we are the market leader <laughs> so far. <laughs> and I tell you more about that. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so a few numbers about Continental. Uh, last year, 39.2 billion of sales, 210,000 people in the world globally, and uh, 30,000 engineers uh, over the world in 100 uh, centers. R&D locations and uh, R&D effort is 2.4 billion. So what is core, what is context? Uh, I would say engineering R&D is core for us. And um, you see it a bit lower there is the talking about the complexity in R&D. Uh, on the x-axis, you see the number of projects. Each needle is a project. And on the vertical, you see the number of involved locations. And the blue is talking about 2011 and the orange about 2014. Yeah, so that you see the increase of complexity in only three years. Yeah, and we need to manage it over 100 locations. So what we will change and how we uh, uh, answer to that uh, challenges is we have the markets on the top. That means our headquarters in each uh, markets like China, like North America, like uh, Europe. We have Frankfurt, we have Regensburg. So all these um, market representatives interacting with the customers, having their plans uh, in their markets, in their countries. And we have the R&D centers uh, supporting them. And we will um, install mature 
uh, R&D hubs. We have one in Guadalajara, talking about 1,200 people. We have uh, one in Romania, which is 4,000 something. And uh, we have uh, in, in Singapore the next one. So these mature R&D centers can handle uh, uh, full products in their region and they will take care for the other smaller centers to educate them, to build them up, to find the right talent at the right spot. That is what we are doing uh, with these mature hubs. Bangalore, we have the center. I was heading Bangalore for a while and uh, that will be a global software supply center. So, in the region, for the region, regional intelligence, yeah, so the people, the mature hubs knows about the region, R&D efficiency will be increased because uh, they know how to develop a product and they will roll it out to other centers in their region and gain, train and retain talents. I think that is the most important part for uh, R&D to find the right talent at the right spot and we know they are, how to say, will not uh, uh, so easily be moved uh, out of their region, out of their country, out of their city. So we need to be there. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Great. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Peter, uh, over to you. Uh, huh? So Joe's at the stage, so I need to start off. I thought we'd <laughs> yeah. make a panel <laughs> with the screen over there, but maybe you I go there. The <laughs> you test my memory. <laughs> Um, that's not working. No, it is working. Um, I guess many of the things I'm telling you today or I'm showing you and I leave you with two corporate slides we use in Intel these days. Um, what we foresee in the outside in view to it is um, to change the, the ecosystem we are working in. One of the things, and this is to understand why the transformation we are currently heading is um, important, is that today um, we see the world changing. The way we have the relationships to technology is different than it was a couple of years back. It is anything is connected. It's not only us going to be connected with the, through our devices, but it is the devices to be connected itself. That is a fundamental shift, and we believe it is similar to the, uh, to the transformation from analog to digital. It is massive. It is really huge. And we saw this picture or this video on, on the 4G to 5G change, how, this, how quickly these robots adapt. That, I guess that gives a nice or a good understanding what this, what this means in times of, of an uplift. Okay, so it's not necessarily going, so you made a PDF out of it? <coughs> it it's fine. So how we translate it in Intel is we, we translate all of this into a, we call it the virtuous cycle of growth. That is actually how we believe we can add value to, into this. And um, Intel today is shifting bottom up. Um, we do have cloud, we ever had been data centers, we have been stronger, we have massive compute power. We have anything that goes into it, so it is about the things. We have, pro it's not working? No, no, it's okay. Okay. Um, we have program programmable um, devices like FPGA that helps us to accelerate all of this, but it is important, and this is the most critical item to it, things will be connecting. It is all instantly connected going forward, and that will translate into the most, m most important change. What this means for us, um, we as a procurement function, we need to change in the, in the way we behave. Typically, procurement has been a more, more kind of a supply chain organization. We believe as a strategic procurement organization, we need to at attract or we need to go into business differently. Intel is changing from a company that used to have a very single skew approach into multiple programs. We have a transformation from a product-centric to a customer-centric um, organization or company. And that is, uh, that is giving us a different way in how we go into it. It is the, how to get it? Supply chain is a kind of a, and I have supply chain colleagues here, so I need to be a little bit um, cautious what I'm telling you. So there's nothing about supply chain. That is a very important thing to have. But if you deal R&D, and that's what we are talking today, you need to have a different approach. It's about value creation less than on tactical fulfillment. That is the differences we do today. And we believe as procurement, uh, we play a pivotal role going forward for Intel. We have and we own the external workforces and we own the third party development. That is essential for the company to be successful going forward. Um, 
going back to supply chain, we take a, long, a lot, le lot of lessons out of this. So there's a lot of things you need to do from a supply perspective. That's what we typically are good in. That is how to do forecasts, how to be predictive on things. So that's what we put in play. And finally, and that's the most important piece for it, it needs to be collaborative. It needs to be a partnership with companies like Altron potentially. Um, where we can go and where we build out an ecosystem to, towards a joint vision and a joint mission. We need to do things together rather than just working through our RFPs and SOWs in order to drive what is, what is important. I personally foresee a future where we don't have any contracts in between us because we don't need them. We have a, we have a joint understanding of what is important for the business to be accomplished and we manage business jointly towards these goals. And that's what we drive as a procurement function in Intel these days, and obviously why these guys invited me to be here. So let's see what the panel brings. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So that's the one. Just a second. So it's partly, partly automatic. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. I'm Pascal Brouillet and I'm Chief uh, Strategy and Innovation Officer for Altran. Uh, very short introduction. I had put a placeholder on Altran, but Dominique covered it, so I think you, you understand who, you, who we are now for those of you who never met with our company. One thing maybe in that slide which is important is that the whole subject of today is about how do you uh, lead uh, disruptions, and part of that subject for us was a reason to update our mission and uh, we, we redefine it, uh, as you can read it, as uh, in an era of disruption where innovation is redefining organization future success, we help companies overcome their R&D and manufacturing challenges because we talked a lot, uh, a lot today with R&D, but we think that in the future there will be also many manufacturing challenges due to these huge technology disruptions and win in the digital age. So this is really what we are talking about uh, today. And in fact, uh, for us, what uh, Dominique uh, uh, described as the six R&D tyrannies was also a call inside the company to say, hey, maybe we should update our business model. Because when we ask our CEOs, our customers, how they think they should set their priority on innovation, we see that most of them, this is the yellow part here, are in fact calling for a new sourcing model, a new ways to work with partners, define scope of work, define contractual agreement, and that type of thing. And that's the reason why, like any engineering companies, we had placed a big placeholder on making sure that we have one, a deep domain expertise, so that we, we, we can really supplement you, help you, support you in everything you do with the right expert. But at the same time that we have an industrialized way of putting those resources so that we don't do twice the same thing. But it was not enough. So that's why we took this uh, idea or, of uh, saying we should adapt that domain expertise to this core context type of thing and try to match it with our customers. And by doing this exercise, we, we realized that our own organization internally, our own R&D to some extent, was also not enough. So that's why we defined three areas on top of what we have already, which is areas in which we wanted to have extra resources, extra uh, business model, new types of offering for our customers. The one uh, being this innovative product development where we say we need to be in a position to help our customers very early in the process with brand new technologies when them and us are asking the question, what should I do with those technologies? A second one, which is the world-class centers, where it's all about scaling and making sure we attack the time to market pro program and process. And the last one be being this industrialized global show that Dominic referred to, which is all about how do I manage these activities going from core to context when it's all about should I really be doing it or should I entrust someone to do it for me? So for us, this was really this question on uh, how do you manage the core? Also internally, we reviewed that type of thing. What we've been doing then is we have applied it to uh, various uh, industries and that's how we came across with Zenof where we said you can help us on building some templates by industry on what kind of activities would be subject to this core context uh, type of dilemma. And then we tailor 
uh, each uh, of those uh, work to our different companies because obviously your core is not your neighbor's core, is not my core. We all have our own view and our own decision on how we do this. But this is as an introduction, the work that we've been doing on trying to maximize the core, which was the subject for that panel. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we've all uh, heard a lot of uh, presentations and we've uh, many things. What I want to do is get into a lot more uh, practitioner perspective. So Joe, you handle 100 plus centers, really? <laughs> and, and so in this, in this whole, um, in, this, in this massive, so in this massive journey of core context, you've heard so many things, right? We've heard disruption and we all agree, I'm sure that automotive is at the forefront of this uh, disruption. How, do you, how are you looking at it? How are you looking at global locations? How do you think through core context at a location level? And do you like strategize between locations or within every location you have a strategy? How exactly do you think through it? Sure. So um, the, the locations, um, you mentioned 100. I need to correct. It's not me. I'm managing it, but uh, I'm, I'm observing it, and I'm consulting them, and I'm, uh, how to say, strategically uh, uh, set them up. You don't need to be modest, Joe. It's OK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, the, the, always the question is how these uh, um, centers are interacting between each other. Today we have a, a structured uh, organization that means the headquarters are uh, addressing a task to, to the centers and uh, they, they get delivered and, and uh, the product will get the next step of development releases. And we, we, but centers are developing. Yeah? For example, Romania, they, they are uh, uh, gaining the product leadership for several products already, and they have the customer interaction already in Romania. So the customer appreciates that we have a center in Romania and they will travel to Romania to, to have their discussions locally. Yeah? And so that is the way how we do it. And uh, yeah, there are centers who are not yet on that maturity level, but they, 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 they are educated. Uh, we are working with them to bring them up. Yeah? And then they will have a real contribution in regards to innovation, in regards to new product developments. Interesting. So Peter, a question for you. Uh, I don't know if it's correct, but I, at some point in time, Intel did have more than 200, 300 suppliers for just product engineering. And knowing Semiconductor, it's very local, a uh, few people working in different locations in different sites. And you, of course, last four years, there's seen, been a massive transformation. Um, and again, there is transformation at the industry level. There is transformation at the location level. Uh, how is it that you see the future? Uh, you, you did mention a few things about, I, mean, I, I read your last slide, there were seven words on strategy. Uh, but could you give like concrete examples in terms of uh, how you have managed to change the way Intel uh, behaves when it looks at service providers? And what are the different models that you're experimenting? And which of them have been successful so far and which are not? Um, I guess to be honest, we managed more than 800 suppliers in the beginning. I guess we are very successful today with having less than 150, so it's, um, we made some changes. Um, and um, over lunch, we had a lengthy debate whether we consolidate or we do not. Um, I, yes, we call it consolidation for many reasons, just because it's a typical procurement language, right? It's how you sell things. I personally don't believe it is a consolidation that we actively try, but, uh, but we want to enable an ecosystem. We want to enable our partners to pick up business, to grow together with us, and put all of these boutique shops, all of these niche players, all of these, I don't know, me too suppliers out of the pipe. It's nothing that we will mandate into the company. That's nothing that we will drive into and just say, okay, you're not allowed to use it. It is about a partnership, a partnership where we are trying to identify the right supplier we work with and we built these, these capabilities. It is something that is a journey that will require some time for the change. Could you give some examples as to how you try? Of course, you may leave out names, but so for example, in certain areas, you experiment with a different model and really how did that help you achieve better things in core or move out stuff in context? So when I, when I observe the engineering market today, the suppliers that are active in this, there are some that are very centric, very niche and boutique around a very limited knowledge. You have some bigger ones that hold pockets of expertise. You have some very big ones that hold pockets of expertise in anything you require. 
but hardly you see any that builds a practice over it, right? It is not about owning all of the different steps of the development, it's about how you can make them together. You can optimize silos as long as you will, you will never have a flow that obviously pro provides value and drives it. And that's the, that's the kind of change we want to do, and that's the kind of um, journey we have started. Uh, I wouldn't say we have succeeded now. We already went down a lot on the numbers of suppliers we already have. If I look into it on the, from a spend and percentage perspective, I guess we have our top five suppliers owning more than 75% of our spend, so we already do quite nice. But still we have this long tail. And we don't maintain this long tail because we, look, we want to have it. But we typically do it just because we don't have this one partner that was enabling us to take the tail away. So pass me from your perspective, right? you've heard a lot of good things from the sourcing department and different, so Joe talked about using different hubs to manage engineering and how that flows through and that's how we can manage more than 100. And they talked about a different way of engaging with service providers. Is this, is this just theory? Have you seen this with some of the other customers or how is it panning out for you and some of the interesting examples that you would have seen? No, as, as Peter said, we are currently seeing a shift in the way our customers are talking to us and, and in their requirements towards engineering companies. You know, for years and for decades even, uh, we were expected to be supportive, answering needs to very specific questions. Basically reactive. Being very reactive. Okay. Understanding the problem and supporting our customers. And there is a complete shift to the other side, which is, to some extent, our customers coming to us and say, hey, come on, you've been around for 20 years, you should understand our business, you should know what we need. So now it goes, we extend the question of, help me do it to two types of new questions. The first one being, what should I do? So let's share on that subject, what do you do, what do I do, can we do it together? Or can you give me some guidelines on what the others are doing? If you're really a true engineering company, working worldwide with many companies, you should give me some insight. And the other part being, do it for me. And that's for us something like a disruption as well, because mm -hmm. this is absolutely not the same type of engagement model. This is absolutely not the same type of organization internally for us. This is also not maybe the same kind of people that you need to be able to, uh, to answer that, uh, that type of question. This is, for the moment, still, uh, I would say, an emerging trend, but we see that as something which will develop over the years to come. Interesting. Good. I think I went through the first round of questions, and I really wanted to open, up, open it up to the audience. Uh, any questions that you would have for the panelists? I hope you had some good coffee. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's, there's one coming your way. <laughs> Let's check anyway. Looks like it's on, maybe. Um, I'm mindful that Ultran's on the stage here, so it might be biased to answer this question. But um, we're talking about flexibility, uh, responding to change, uh, and, and companies have to be able to move around that loop that you, you talked about earlier. So the question is, what do you think is the healthy balance for internal and external employees in a technology-rich company? Interesting. So, Joe, you want to start on that? I see you smiling. I know you have some thoughts on that. Yeah, I would say there is no healthy uh, ratio between internal and external. Uh, um, so do you not have any thumb rules? 5%, no, no, 10%, no, no. 50%? <laughs> I, have, I have a lot of numbers in my head, but <laughs> no, no thumb rules. Um, the, uh, I would say um, the infiltration of ideas, of innovation, will come always crossing the culture, crossing the countries, uh, working with internals or externals. Yeah, and uh, I think that makes life, uh, um, how to say, uh, engaged and, and, and that creates new ideas. Yeah. So, um, as, as uh, Pascal said, um, uh, it's it's like. Um, uh, when, when we talk about a center, it's like a, a, a supply uh, um, base yeah, or a supplier. So we engage them now as uh, we, we have one of our courses, Freedom to Act. We engage them to contribute more, to be self-confident, to develop their, their ideas by their own call-in uh, um, 
the, their infrastructure, their ecosystem of engineering. Yeah? I have one, one nice example, you know, traffic sign recognition, the speed limits, yeah? you just count the red dots and the white dots and the black dots and then it's a, it's a seven. Yeah? So that is the recognition. Now we are talking about reading, yeah? because the uh, speed limit is only valid for uh, Sundays between eight and nine o'clock in the morning yeah? because of noise and whatever. Yeah? So this is very, uh, 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 difficult to now count only the pixels, you need an OCR engine. Yeah. So we interacted with the startup and we uh, engaged with the startup, we gave them a challenge and, and they s succeeded. Now we have a product. Yeah. And that is uh, done in India, that means the ecosystem, they use the ecosystem locally to create a new product. Yeah. Interesting. Peter, your thoughts on that? try to add on it. I guess when we have this, we had these, these, I don't know, these decades of different innovation types before, and I guess there has, there is kind of rule of thumb in the, in the past that, you know, I don't know, 25% of your business needs to be outsourced that is healthy. I don't believe we have these, these, these strict ratios, just because I, I guess the more important thing, and that is what Dominic also was talking about a little, we need to define what is core. What is the important things for us we want to drive, we want to own, and we need to make a, we need, we need to make a call how we get the rest into market. I have no, I have no excuse today, again, in, just taking Intel as an example. We used to be a product company. Anybody was waiting for our newest generations of our CPUs just because there was, was no competition. Sorry to my friends from IMD, but... Uh, <laughs> That's, that's gone, that's not, that's not reality anymore. We need to be on time, we need to build not only the technology, but we need to make a solution out of the to, uh, technology. And I would argue it is blunt and naive to believe that I can hold all of the engineers that can drive these solutions, that, be, that are innovative enough to build these solutions. So I still will need them, and I still will need to have them in the market on time and in the right quality. So without, without going outside, without opening my, 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 my portfolio to invite, be it startups, be it engineering companies, be it OEMs or ODMs, whatever. It is, it's just not the right thing. It is, there, is no, there is no limit to it. I guess the, the, the important thing, and this is the new core, is to understand what is close to you, what is the mission critical things that also are protective enough that you need to have them on your own, but that you need to keep this knowledge. Any good examples you have seen, Pascal, across different companies? No uh, example, I don't know, but maybe figures about that. There's two things we could say. The first one is, and I don't know if it's for right or wrong reasons, but what we can see is that when industry matures, the rate of outsourcing and externalization and using partner is growing. That's one rule. Uh, the second one is that when an, an industry is maturing, the reasons for calling on partners and external resources changes from pure labor type of flexibility slash uh, ramp up uh, type of problems towards more sophisticated reasons for building an ecosystem around that. So that's what we see. So you have very mature industries like semiconductor or automotive or to some extent aerospace and they have a high rate of using partners and building ecosystem. And you have less mature industry, at least in that space, like, I don't know, life sciences, for example, but which is, in fact, building the same patterns as the other industries, just they do it 15 years after. So I don't know if it's, uh, if, if it's right or wrong, but what we see is that, in fact, the rate of uh, using partners and companies like us uh, is, is growing and part of it is for the reason we expressed uh, uh, before is that more and more our customers realize that the, the worst thing that can happen to any company is to have its best resourcings being stuck into something which becomes irrelevant. Mm. Uh, and, and that's a problem that all of us are facing. So. That's a good way if you want to avoid that to say, well, I need to repurpose my people to what is really important for me. And what do I do with this? Maybe I can partner with someone to make it uh, uh, the right way. Interesting. Any, any questions? Any, yeah, gentleman in the back. Yeah. 
Hey, I have a question. So when you are cooperating with a lot of startups or the partners, and how you actually selecting the ones that you're investing further? How are you selecting those kind of a genius kind of ideas that you're moving forward, especially that you know you don't know what you don't know? <laughs> Interesting. Well, let me let me try and nuance that a little bit. So, Joe, you spoke about an uh, an example of using a startup for a specific area, and Peter, your, uh, everybody knows Intel has Intel Capital and it invests separately. Now, is there what are the different models that you have seen? So, you, maybe Joe, you can start, and Peter, you can add. And uh... yeah, up to now, we don't have this venture capital uh, um, like Bosch or like Intel. Um, we decide on, how to say, the opportunity of the technology. Um, once we believe that it's the right one, yeah, we just bought a company in, in uh, Santa Clara, uh, Santa Barbara in, in North America, take to develop a laser system, yeah, and laser uh, sensors. So we believe that this technology will be the new success, will create a new product, and then we invest there. Interesting. Your thoughts on that? So uh, uh, let me know is that right? So there is always the supply chain or now you said procurement department would look at external ecosystem. For us, external ecosystem also includes startups. So do you see the role of yourself or a procurement organization even in sourcing technology? Because at the end of the day, that is what it is from even startups. Um, so because you felt that Intel Capital is somehow investing on its own, that's not necessarily true. They invest in our roadmaps and our strategies and um, we have together with the business very good due diligence processes in order to understand what is the technologies we may look at, what is the startups you want to have, what to participate in. So it is not that independent. Um, it's still revenue driven, that's for sure, and so they need to get back some some kicker on it, so that's the idea. But it's still also very, very strategically be, being used in order to exactly al uh, allow this, this um, innovation through startups. And typically what we do and how we handle it is we are going into this, we are, we are investing, we keep an eye on it, and somehow we are, we are taking it over. We just did it with our, drone, uh, with our recent drones acquisition. We have been invested in this in the beginning. We helped them to, to scale and to build, and finally we integrated them into the company you know, because it became an, a new core for us. The drones is just something that we feel is the future, and we, we want to have it, we want to drive it, just because it holds a lot of technologies we have. Um, and that's the kind of the life cycle what we how we try to work together with this startup ecosystem and uh, Intel Capital gives us a very good way of handling it um, but it's still still a tough thing because and your question was right how do you identify the right ones you need to it's a trial and error right just make many and hope that one or two are getting are paying off no seriously that's how you build a, how you do a startup, right? Even on the other side, you, you try, you fail, and um, you start from the beginning. So yeah, I mean, makes sense. Um, so you've been acquiring a few startups recently. I mean, that's I mean, we've not seen service providers acquire startups, but you've been doing that recently. So what's your perspective? How do you look at it? Is it in the new core that you're trying to acquire? Uh, how are you thinking through this, and what's the process? Well, uh, we've been acquiring companies. I don't know if you can call them startups because they were in areas where we already could figure out the business models and the customers, and they already had the business, so it's not really. But if you, if you look at startups, I would agree with the fact that there is always a leap of faith somewhere because, I mean, you never know what you don't know, as you said. Uh, what, what we are trying to do, it's a bit different for us because, I mean, the outcome is not the same. It's not about, uh, I mean, integrating it in our own product. We don't have product. We support your products. So what we do is uh, we are part of um, the Open Forum Institute, the Open Innovation Institute, and we are an active member in it because that's very interesting for us just to learn how you work with startups because we think that it's going to be crucial in the future with our own customers because that's going to be triangular between startups, us, and them. So we need to understand how, how, how they, uh, they act. The uh, second thing that we are doing with them is that uh, sometimes we are mentoring and sheltering uh, um, uh, startups because we think they complement what we offer. Uh, our world-class centers are uh, channeling some assets and IP to the market, to our customers, but they are only, we don't do products. 
we will never compete with our customers. That's a rule that we have set for ourselves. We will never compete with our customers. So we offer what we call minimum viable product. This is to some extent an architecture, a technology block on which you can build a complete solution or an application. But it's never enough. There's always something missing. So a startup is a good way to complement what, what we have. Then what we would do, we would choose the startup that complement what we have. And sometimes we do some investment. We did that with Divergent 3D that uh, Dominique mentioned, only because we think that company will change the way we will manufacture cars, but only cars. We will manufacture, I mean, uh, uh, trains and, and maybe part of planes in the future. Where in the future, I, I, I just don't know. But we thought it was really interesting. If our role is to help our customers understand what they can do with new technologies, we need to understand that technology. So we said, let's jump up front on it because we believe it's going to be a game changer into the automotive industry and in some other industries. So let's invest on it and let's become an engineering partner to this startup. I think we're going to help them a lot because we will bring them, I would say, the industrial part that they need, but they will help us a lot also because they're giving us a new way to look at how you build a body uh, for Great. a car. Great. Actually, add to this yeah. because you made a you made a point um, in, in in what you were saying that you believe you don't should have you shouldn't have your own products, right? Yeah. You made a very strong comment. Uh, we we step away from it. I, I just can invite you to do it because all what we want to have you doing going forward will need these skills. If you really take an end-to-end -end product, you, you start with the, with the industrial design, you do the system engineering, you do the, the, the programming, and really, uh, finally really bring the product into market, that's a capability we will ask you to do. I know that over the last, I don't know, 10 to 15 years, we went, all went out to our partners, our, our engineering companies, and said, hey, never become a product company, don't get into our competition. The future is requiring something completely different. Mm -hmm. Because productizing, really getting a product out, yeah, exactly. requires a different mindset and exactly. a different philosophy. Exactly. Right. I think that's an interesting point that you make. And we've seen that across the board. Right. So, uh, to an extent, to me, it's um, almost the insecurity of some of the product companies to say. And we had a very big case wherein a service provider was almost blacklisted for you know, having one of the frameworks, per se. Uh, but as you mentioned, things are changing. And uh, I think we are moving in the right course there. One final question, I guess, is what uh, we would have time for. Anyone? Yeah. I can do this with other Okay, perfect. <laughs> No, seriously. So um, there is a lot of ways where we try to play a kind of an incubator role, where we try to go back and we make um, competitions where startup can just bring in their ideas. We put, um, I, I missed the name, but we do it annually with the telecom together and all of these. We take them all in at Cisco and it. We, we then select the top, I don't know, 10 to 20. We, we give them mentors from, from our company, helping them to build all of this and then we bring it somewhere. So yes, we are doing it. Um, it is still a very sales-driven activity. It is less for the learning perspective on how, an, how a startup is working, what is their way on, on being innovative. So we are not taking this learning away today good enough. We understand that there is value in it. But as a big operation, it is very hard to actually work with a with a startup for many reasons, just because we have so many so many interdependencies that are hard to manage. We are not necessarily age, uh, not actually flexible and fast enough to really keep pace with them. But it's a something that is absolutely valuable, and um, it's on the I would say on the radar and partially already implemented. Yeah. I'll just quickly add to that. So one of the examples from the companies that we work with. Uh, it's a pretty large aerospace uh, tier one supplier. And the way they're trying to do it is every quarter, they bring in five uh, great startups from the ecosystem. And they uh, 
go walk them through their own product development process in terms of how they thought about it, how they ideated around it, uh, what kind of customers did they speak to. And they have all their product managers, which would be more than 200 of them, sit in the room and listen to them. And they go back and they do workshops to understand how they can redefine the way they are thinking through product. So there are uh, things uh, that are happening. One, I think the gentleman there had a question. So. <laughs> so, so what's what's the question, sir? Yeah, you, you have to walk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So, is there a question, sir? Uh, okay. I, maybe if I were to quickly rephrase that, um, if this whole core context dynamic. Um, what is the best way to manage risks, or how do we un ensure that in this whole change and the way we are managing through different regions and different partners, what's the best way and the, what are the biggest risks that we are supposed to manage? I, I, can, I can try to answer it. I don't know whether I get the best answer to it, but at the end of the day, it's a question whether we, are, uh, whether we look for doomsday or not, right? Uh, we all watch Terminator, and it's a threat to us that sometimes machines will take over. Are they really taking over? I don't know. Maybe it happens or not. Um, all the new networks um, are being designed to not go away, right? We have a battery problem, yes. So maybe your phone is running out of battery, so you have a little power pack and you, you continue charging it. Um, we have technologies that are simultaneous or, or charging phones while you are in the room. You, do, you don't need to pluck it. So that's not becoming a problem going forward. I guess that has been taken away. It is more like the question, are we hesitant to the new technology? So do we fear it or do we, or do we accept it and do we feel it as something that is creating value? I see it from this angle when I talk to my mother on, I don't know whether an iPhone is something great or not and how, whether my daughter, which is three year old, needs to be able to use it or not. She will come totally different mind. She is even telling me that going to a university is the best you can, uh, to a uh, library is the best you can do in, in Earth. I don't feel it. I don't know why I, need to get, why I need to go there to get the book, why I can use my phone and just instant, instantly leave, get the information required. The question is, and this is the, that is the change we, we are facing today, we are all used to, um, to these physical things. We are used to the book that is paper that we pick out of, a, of, out of a cabinet and we read in it. The question is, is the book the important thing or is the information in the book the most important topic? And that's the kind of the, that's the kind of, change that is in front of us and us being no, uh, grown up in a, in a time where you pick the book and you felt the book is something that is the important thing, we have a problem with it. My daughter, she has not. She is she's using the phone three years. She can, do, she can just take it. She's taking her own movies in. She's starting her apps. She's calling, her, she's calling my mother in with FaceTime just to, just to see her. When, when she's coming over, they don't have any, any problem in getting co uh, close to each other because they, they just speak and see each other daily. That's, that's just the differences, right? And we are not used to it because we never had it before. So for us, it's something new. Um, for the younger generations, at least our kids, they don't have this problem anymore. So I think I would just round it off by saying whatever technology, the biggest thing that we have is freedom, and freedom gives us choice. So it's our choice to use it or not use it. So I think with that, I think we've had a great discussion. So thank you, each of the panelists, uh, for sharing your perspective and your experience. Uh, thank you so much. We'll catch you around.